special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics' mission at horizontherapeutics.com. There's been a lot of God moments, I guess, as we look back at them, you know, whether they be teachers who taught him in school who were thinking about retiring but saw him coming up the road and decided not to retire or talking to a doctor who suggests a surgery that's radical but it works or meeting people through Special Olympics that have grown to be great friends over the years and and we care about them. So, you know, it's not all been negative. A lot of it has been, when you look back, a lot of positives. That's our guest this week, Tony Brescia, a father, husband, and owner of a Hallmark store in Rolling Meadows, Illinois. Tony and his wife, Joelle, have two sons, one of whom, Alex, was born with tuberous sclerosis, a rare genetic disease. We'll hear Tony's story, including how he and his wife are working to create a unique residential community for adults with disabilities. That's all on this special Father's Network Dad to Dad podcast. Say hello now to the host of the Dad to Dad podcast and founder of the Special Fathers Network, David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. So now let's hear this intriguing conversation between Tony Brescia and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with my friend Tony Brescia of West Dundee, Illinois, who owns a Hallmark store, is the father of two, including a son with tuberous sclerosis, and more recently is raising funds to create Project Alex Communities, a unique residential community for adults with intellectual disabilities. Tony, thank you for taking the time to do a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. No problem, David. You and your wife, Joelle, have been married for 34 years and are the proud parents of two boys, Jason, 28, and Alex, 32, who was born with tuberous sclerosis, a rare genetic disease that causes non-cancerous benign tumors to grow in the brain and several areas of the body, including the spinal cord, nerves, eyes, lung, heart, kidneys, and skin. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. Um, I grew up in... Mount Prospect, Illinois, which is a northwest suburb of Chicago. I have one brother who's three years younger than I am. I grew up uh, with my two folks and and a very close-knit Italian family. My grandparents and several aunts lived next door, and so we we were all in one space. I'm sort of curious to know, what did your dad do for a living? Well, he started out as an auditor for some banks, and that's where he met my mom. But then he progressed through and, and went into human resources for a uh, photo processing company. While he was there, he took a second job working at a pool and patio store. During that time where he was working both those jobs, he had a friend come to him and say he had this great idea about creating a direct mail company. So he worked three jobs, but eventually he left the two and worked full time at the uh, direct mail house, which grew to employing over 500 people and putting together over 2 million pieces of mail a day. That sounds like quite a big operation. It, it was huge. We uh, opened a building that was about the size of a football field. So were you and your brother involved with the business at all? Uh, we, we started in being involved from a very young age. I remember going in on Saturdays with my dad and, and we did this one job where we had to put letters in a box and then hot seal them with plastic but you had then poke holes in the seal when it came out otherwise the stuff was going to blow up so we had this little push pin and as the stuff was king on the conveyor belt you had to put three holes in it and then 
put it onto the pallet. That's where it started. And my dad brought lots of uh, work home in the beginning if we were behind. And so we'd have an assembly line at home. My grandparents, my mom, a couple aunts, my dad, and we'd hand stuff envelopes and lick them with little sponges and seal them up. Then we moved into working in the office with them for a while. And while he did interviews to hire people, he'd come out and go, what'd you think of her? What'd you think of him? What'd you think? So and then eventually, after I graduated college, I went to work for him and worked with the uh, the purchasing and the human resources and doing a bunch of stuff. So yeah, I was sort of a jack of all trades with him. And did you and your brother actually end up taking over the business after your parents exited or? No, um, probably about 30 years ago, his partner did a bad takeover kind of a thing. He came in and he sort of ran the company into debt a little bit. My dad wasn't realizing what was happening, even though if he did the accounting stuff. And he came in and said he was going to buy him out. And we went through a really terrible time. My dad had a heart attack during that time because of the stress and the strain and eventually just sold out to him. And we as a family moved on. So I'm sort of curious to know, how would you um, describe your relationship with your dad? Kind of all over the board. I was younger and he was working so much. We didn't have a lot of relationship because he'd come home after, you know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night and we'd be in bed. As we progressed, it got way better. We were closer. We did a lot more together. But then we became really close while I was in college. He used to call me and ask me questions on how to deal with my brother. And so after that point, we became real close. And then as he got older and, and we worked more together, it was, we were a lot closer. Well, uh, thanks for sharing. I'm wondering, when you think about your dad, is there a takeaway or two, a lesson learned about parenting, being a father that you've tried to incorporate into your own experience? Even though he wasn't there, we always knew that he loved us. We always knew that he cared about us. We always knew he was trying to to build a better life for us. Um, that's why he worked as much as he did. Um, and I think that that really stood out as, as we were growing up. So your dad had a good work ethic. I know that. It's perhaps something that you know he's passed down to you. Yeah. And um, he sounded like he was very family-centric, right? He spent an increasing amount of time with you and your brother as you each got older. Anything else that comes to mind? Probably. I mean, the two biggest lessons I think he probably taught me was that uh, your word is your bond. You know, it doesn't matter what's on paper. You, you don't make a promise. You don't shake somebody's hand. You don't tell them you're going to do something if you don't intend on doing it. People might not like the answer and the response if you don't give them what they want, but you're being true to who you are and, and not promising stuff you shouldn't promise. Uh, and then probably the other takeaway is keep moving forward. Don't sit and wallow on the bad and don't over-celebrate the good <laughs> because at some point it might come back and, and bite you. So I'm thinking about other father figures and I'm wondering if there's any other men that come to mind that played an influential role when you were growing up or perhaps as a young adult for that matter? I start out with my father-in-law. You know, Joel and I met when we were in our early 20s. He always, always accepted me for who I was, always made me feel at home, but always accepted me for, for who I was, always open-armed, you know, a welcoming. Um, we didn't have a problem talking. We didn't have a problem thinking you know, together and hashing out ideas. Um, he was, he was very much a man of many talents and many thoughts. So my recollection was you went to Aquinas College in Grand Rapids and you took a degree in business administration. You already mentioned that uh, you went to work uh, with your dad out of college. And I'm wondering what was it that helped you with the transition from working college in the family business to today and for a long time now, owning a Hallmark store? Part of it was necessity, trying to find something to do when my, when my dad got rid of our company. And I just tried to figure out what I enjoyed doing and where we were at at the time. You know, at the time, my mom was 
sort of a mini collector of statuettes and precious moments and whatever. And I was like, hmm, wonder if I could do this. So there was a guy near our business that I had become friendly with who owned a Hallmark store. And I just kind of was talking to him and he introduced me to the people who ran the Chicago area. And one thing led to another. Been doing it so long now, I don't even remember how long. But it's it's still fun, you know, 90% of the time. Ten <laughs> percent of the time are the frustrations of dealing with the public and them not understanding. You don't print cards in your back room or, or make. Uh, you know, I don't have a porcelain factory in the back to make a picture frame or something that we don't have in stock anymore. So I'm sort of curious to know how did you and Joel meet? We met through a young adults group. I had met some young adults at my church who connected up with a group of other churches in Des Plaines and started basically a, a volleyball Sunday with a bunch of young adults from, from the Catholic churches in Des Plaines and Mount Prospect. And Joelle had a friend who had a friend that was in the Des Plaines group, and she came to volleyball on one Sunday. And uh, at that point, I knew we were going to date, even though she didn't yet. <laughs> and then after about... <laughs> Three or four dates, I knew I was going to marry her. She said no the first time I asked her after about a week or two. Uh, and I told her I'll give her 12 times. And if she doesn't say yes by the 12th, I'm out the door. So, <laughs> Did you tell her she's going to get 12 times or did you think that she was going to have 12 times? Nope, I told her. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and she said yes by I think the 6th or 7th. So it was okay. Okay. So we were way ahead of the 12th. <laughs> you had some leeway there, yeah. I had some leeway, and I didn't think I was going to waste a whole lot of my time going past the 12, because if I couldn't win her over by then, there, there, was, there was no hope. <laughs> okay. Well, I like your open, transparent way of doing things. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about special needs first on a personal basis and then uh, beyond. I'm sort of curious to know, prior to Alex's situation, did you or Joelle have any connection to the world of disability or special needs? Yeah, I have a, a cousin that was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. He was born when I was in college, so gosh, you know, I think he's 35 now. He's a quadriplegic, he, he, uh, nonverbal. He's also got a seizure disorder, so as he was a child and, you know, growing up and stuff, they'd come visit my grandmother. And since they were next door, we'd spend a lot of time together. And when my aunt and uncle would go out, like to dinner or do stuff, I'd go next door and help grandma take care of him. And Joel just kind of fell into it when we started dating and got engaged that uh, she just started spending time and talking to him and, and doing stuff. So that was probably our biggest, biggest connection. Okay. So what is Alex's diagnosis and how did it come about? His official diagnosis is tuberous sclerosis. We weren't diagnosed right away. He was born after a normal pregnancy. You know, everything else was normal. Joel had a C-section, which wasn't a big deal. You know, everything got done. I went home, slept overnight. She called me probably about 6.30 in the morning saying Alex was having a seizure in the, in the nursery one of the nurses noticed it, and they were going to airlift him to Children's Memorial Hospital downtown. Nobody knew exactly what was happening and, and what was going on. So I came to the hospital. Joel and I watched him be carted down the, the, the street in the, or the, the hallway in the incubator. They brought him up to the helicopter and airlifted him to Children's. I followed soon after. We spent 17 days at Children's with them trying to figure out what was happening, and they didn't know. Uh, all they knew that he was is he was suffering from 75 to 100 seizures a day. Wow. So after about two weeks, and I got Joel out of the hospital after we went, I was going back and forth for a while. Uh, we had a meeting with the doctors there saying, okay, where do we go? And I'm like, well, we just want to watch him some more. And, and they said they wanted to monitor seizures. I'm like, you know what? Let's go home. We can monitor the seizures. So we did. And we kind of just survived there for a while. Uh, I started therapy right away. 
Uh, we did home therapy, home PT, home OT. Kind of went around with that. Uh, the seizures weren't stopping with all the medicine that we were on. We would cold turkey one, start another one, bolster, go back and forth. Um, so finally we came up. The doctor suggested that we do a hemispherectomy, uh, which is a removal of his of half his brain. But first they wanted to, tuber sclerosis had been bantered around a while, uh, but we had no definite diagnosis. So before we, we looked into the hemispherectomy, we went to University of Chicago, where the local expert on tuberous was. And we saw him, we saw that doctor, and we came out of the appointment saying he didn't have it. Because at the time, there were major and minor markers, there was no genetic testing, and he didn't think he had enough of the markers to be uh, diagnosed with it. So we went from there. Um, and then investigated the hemispherectomy, uh, went and had that and had half his brain removed when he was 16 months old. Um, his last seizure was the morning of the surgery. Uh, we stopped all his medication uh, probably nine months after the surgery, and he was seizure-free for 15 years. Um Seizures came back during puberty, which led us to investigating more to try to figure out what was happening. Uh, so we, we found a doctor, we went back to University of Chicago, um, which is where everybody said we should try, and happened to get hooked up with a the doctor there who took the position over of the tuberous sclerosis clinic. And now there were more um, diagnostics to, to see if the kids had them. And he did the blood work, and it turns out Alex has a mutation of tuberous, and it was basically he was diagnosed when he was 17. Wow. Yeah, so we went a long time without a diagnosis, but sometimes I think that's better. It was bad in the time, but now that I look back at it, it's probably better because we had no expectations. Yeah, well, you can only look backwards and come to that realization. Yeah. I want to go back to the... Um, Early days, the first few months, mm -hmm. you mentioned that it was suggested that he have a hemispherectomy. Yeah. And I think you said that's the removal of part of the brain tissue. Yes. That sounds like a very dramatic decision to be making. And I'm sort of curious to know if you can put yourself back at that time, what were the conversations you and Janelle were having at that time? Wow. Yeah, that's a terrible decision to make at 27 years old, married for two years, uh, and trying to figure out what to do. I don't know if we ever questioned a lot that we shouldn't do it. It was, it was kind of weird. That was one of those God moments or, or divine type moments that came our way while we were trying to figure out what to do and, and all this stuff was, was coming up and the hemispherectomy was suggested. My dad, during that same time frame, had seen a show on uh, Channel 11, the local public broadcasting station. Um, Bill Curtis, the, one of the local newscasters, was doing an interview with Dr. Ben Carson and he was reviving a surgery called the hemispherectomy to stop seizures. So my dad came to work one day and, and told me about this. And I'm like, eh, dad, that seems awfully radical. I don't know what's what. A few weeks later, one of our secretary's cousins went through a hemispherectomy. And she was telling me about how wonderful it, it is and how it, it stopped those seizures. During that time, totally different because I hadn't talked about Joelle. She picked up a book, Dr. Ben Carson's book about his life and how he was bringing back the hemispherectomy. So it was one of those moments that I don't think we questioned it a whole lot because all the pieces were going into place and we figured, hey, this is definitely the direction we need to go. But it was still a very, very, very hard decision to make. And in fact, when we, we went to John Hopkins to see uh, what their thoughts were, the neurologist there and, and 
Dr. Carson said, yep, I think we need to do this, but we need to bring it to our team first. And a nutritionist on the team said, I'm not going to give my blessing until they try the ketogenic diet, which is a diet that can help control seizures. So when I was talking to the nurse and the doctors during this time, I said, will it help Alex? They're like, no, it probably won't help Alex. I said, then why do I have to try it? Because we need the nutritionist sign off. Like, eh, I'm not so sure that I want to go through a year and a half of a diet and have these seizures. So I picked up the phone, called the Epilepsy Foundation, and they directed me up to Minnesota Epilepsy Clinic out of uh, St. Paul in, in Minneapolis. And we went up there and they're like, yep, we'll do the hemispherectomy. We'll go from there. So it just kind of all fell. So it was a hell of a day going through the surgery, but we managed. <laughs> and just to timestamp that, how old would Alex have been when that procedure was done? Uh, 16 months old. Wow. <laughs> That sounds like a really, really heavy decision to be making at any age, let alone 27, like you said. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm trying to put myself back in that point in time again, and I'm wondering what were some of the fears that you and Joel faced as a parents of such a young child with this type of um, circumstance? Well, you know, I, I guess it would be the normal fears with, with any child going through any surgery, you know what's going to happen during anesthesia will they come out of it you know will we lose him totally because of of the surgery you know will he bleed out we had to get a bunch of blood donated and, and shipped to minnesota because at the time that you know 30 years ago there was lots of other problems with blood and you wanted as much as you can to have people you knew give the blood you know that the surgery was supposed to be like a, I'm trying to say, like a seven-hour surgery, it wound up being closer to a 13-hour surgery. Oh, my. The fears of what's happening, you know, the fear of, God, what happens if the doctor is too tired? You know, what what's he do? Who's he do? You know, who can take over if something happens? Your brain goes crazy, um, but you try to not deal with it and deal with the, the positive outcome as best you can. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. It sounds like a high anxiety um, experience. Was there any meaningful advice beyond having that procedure done that you can look back on and say, oh, yeah, that was really helpful? And I, I don't remember who told us, but it was, it was pretty much don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't, don't let the doctors doctor speak you to death. Ask them to put it in, in realistic terms. Ask them to tell you so you can understand it. And don't be afraid to, to say, okay, what if, or, or ask the questions. You know, if, if you're not comfortable with an answer or, or you're not comfortable signing the paperwork until you get the answers you want or cross out the things you don't want, the, the CYA for the doctor on there, just cross it out. <laughs> Then if they don't want to do the surgery, then they're not, not the right people for you. Yeah, well, what great advice um, to be able to speak up or advocate, right? That's what I heard you saying. Um, don't be intimidated by the doctors or the language that they're using. Yeah. And you know, make sure that you're comfortable with what's going on, even if they have to re-explain it or explain it in different terms to make it more understandable. And again, not to focus on the negative, um, but... Uh, what were some of the bigger challenges that you've encountered along the way? In the beginning, after the hemispherectomy, we were home, I think, for about a month or two. Uh, and he started getting really, really sick. And nobody locally quite knew why. So we went back up to Minnesota. And it turns out he had fluid pulling in the brain. So he, he, was, he had hydrocephalus. So we had to have a... Um, a shunt put in where it's, it's basically a valve that pulls the fluid out of the brain and, and puts it into his stomach. So we had to go back up there and have that done. But probably within the first year, two years of that, we had to go back in and, and those shunts didn't last long. 
for one reason or the other. So we think we had another nine surgeries in those first couple of years until we got done right. So that like halfway through the doctors in Minnesota said, you know what, we're going to find you somebody local. So we started going to Northwestern where one of the doctor's residents had taken a place. So at least we had some connection back to the doctor. And then he was good for a long time. And then uh, we're at Disney World, probably, God, I don't remember when it was. But all of a sudden, he just sort of passed out in his wheelchair or stroller at the time. And nobody knew what it was. So we went back to the hotel and we were there with my folks and my brother and his family. And uh, like, you know what, we need to get to a a hospital, something's not right. So I called our doctor here who directed us to Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital in, in Orlando. And we went in and we were lucky enough that the neurosurgeon was in the emergency room looking at somebody else. And so he looked at, at Alex, checked his shunt and said, oh my God, you know, his pressure is so high. Why is he still alive? So he rushed him into surgery. And this neurosurgeon also happened to be a shunt expert and was working with magnetic timing shunts or, or whatever. So he put one of those in. And since then, knock on wood, we haven't had a shunt malfunction. So um, that was rough. It was rough hearing how can your kids still be alive? And you weren't expecting that here. You were in Disney 10 hours ago and now you're racing to save a life. Wow. And then, uh, when he was in high school or coming out of high school, he was on a, a trip uh, with, with the local organization. And, and one of the kids that was overseeing it let him go into the bathroom by himself. Now, uh, knowing Alex, you know, it, it just he, was, he, he needs help balancing in the bathroom because um, he, he's paralyzed on the one side. Um, but something happened while he was in there by himself because nobody was there and we're not sure what he fell into. Um, we think the seat and then the toilet and then the floor, uh, he wound up with a concussion, um, that lasted about three years and he, we, we totally lost him for a while. He, he wasn't talking during that time. He wasn't doing what he normally did, but you know, after going to visit people at Mary and Joy and talking to them about concussions and, and talking to doctors who were experts, as best as they could think is there was such a shock in the brain. And with only one half a half a brain, no hemisphere, they think the brain just shifted to the other side, elastic back, and all the nerve endings were stretched out. So we had to wait for them to come back together. So our life has been fun, but you know what? I guess now when I look back, I'd trade some of it, but not much of it because we've met a heck of a lot of people and learned a heck of a lot of stuff because of it. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Um, sounds like uh, you've been on a roller coaster, not to use the Disney analogy yeah. too strongly, but uh, you know, it's uh, been a journey, you know, an unpredictable journey. Yeah. We'll be back with more of the conversation on the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast in just a few moments. But first, this quick message. Please help 21st Century Dads gather research on families raising children with special needs by having them complete the Special Fathers Network Early Intervention Parents Survey. A link to the survey can be found in the show notes. As a token of our appreciation, each person, mom or dad, who completes the survey will receive a great dad coin. Thank you. Now, back to the conversation. Were there some turning points that you can look back and say, yeah, you know, we're in a better place today as a result of this or that? I think so. I mean, I, I think because of Alex, I've learned more patience because of Alex I've learned to accept the little things and, and, you know, appreciate the things that happened because of Alex. Joelle and I are closer. Our family has always been there for support. And, you know, we, we've always felt the love, but there are times that the love has been greater because of the things we're going through. 
and, and the people we've met. There's been a lot of of God moments, I guess, as we look back at them, you know, whether they be teachers who taught him in school who were thinking about retiring, but saw him coming up the road and decided not to retire or talking to a doctor who suggests a surgery that's radical, but it works or meeting people through special Olympics that have grown to be great friends over the years. And and we care about them. So, you know, it, it, it's not all been negative. A lot of it has been, when you look back, a lot of positives. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. We do all have the ability to look at the glass, the proverbial glass, if you will, as either being half full or half empty. And uh, I think part of the success that perhaps you've experienced is being positive about it, right? As opposed to dwelling on the negative. And, um, you know, it might be a coping mechanism. It might just be, you know, the way you're, wired, your DNA, uh, which is a blessing in itself. I'm thinking about supporting organizations. You made reference to one, Special Olympics. Uh, What role has Special Olympics played, and are there any other uh, organizations that uh, have played an important role in either Alex's life or in the life of the Brezia family? Well, Special Olympics, um, we were lucky enough, the school district that we were in had a Special Olympics team. So when Alex turned eight, the notice came home saying, hey, you want to try this? So we, we did. And we tried some track and field events where he would, did some wheelchair racing and then um, assisted running and, and tennis ball throws and softball throws. And he moved on to soccer skills and volleyball skills and basketball skills, you know, during his whole time there. And we met some really, really good people. So we had some great times with Special Olympics. NWSRA to a, to a certain bit, which is the uh, Special Recreation Association from uh, the Northwest Suburbs. They were instrumental in the summers when there was no school. He would go to the camps and they would provide aids and help and people there. So that gave, you know, us the break during the day where we didn't have to worry about him. Um, he started therapy when he was eight weeks old through a... Uh, local pediatric therapy place that's run by by two women one of them was a friend of my aunt's which i didn't know and my cousin started going there when he was born which i didn't know until after we got there so they were instrumental in helping him build up his muscles and and move and and they weren't afraid to try different things Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. I'm wondering if there's any other organizations in addition to the Special Olympics that uh, come to mind. Uh, Yeah, I guess the the couple of that have helped the most is uh, Canine Companions for Independence. Alex has a therapy dog through them. They raise the dogs and and train them their first couple years. They match the kids with the dogs or the adults with the dogs based on their needs. They teach you how to to train with them and and make them work for you. And then they get them publicly certified so you can bring them out to restaurants and and stores and and whatever. The other one would be the uh, Tuber Sclerosis Alliance. uh, We've gotten some connections through them and and learned a few things about what to expect. So I'm thinking about uh, experiences beyond your own personal experience or Alex's experience. And um, two come to mind. One, you're a member of the Tuesday Evening Special Fathers Network Mastermind Group. What was it that inspired you to join, and what type of impact has that had? I think what inspired me to join was you, (laughs) just our relationship and different things that I know about you and and Special Fathers Network and the group that you formed. And and I see what the passion that you have, and, and I'm like, you know what? I need these guys in my life to to a bigger degree. You know, we lost a lot of friends as Alex was growing up because they couldn't deal with his disabilities. They couldn't deal with why we couldn't just pack up and go out to dinner, why it took us hours to figure out who was going to sit with them and what to do. And I wanted to share, be around some people who understood that. And and that's why when you announced that you were doing the, these meetups or these smaller groups on top of the larger scale that I wanted to to get involved with them. 
And I, I have to say, it's been wonderful. The guys are great. The experiences are great. You know, you walk away from it feeling not alone. And, and that's a good thing when you were feeling alone for so long because your friends just don't get it. And you lost a few friends because they truly didn't get it. And they, they didn't want to be around her. That was their, their coping mechanism is to, to walk away because they were feeling that they couldn't help. If there's a young dad out there, or maybe even a seasoned dad like yourself, who's raising a child or children with special needs, and they're reluctant, right, to raise their hand or to engage with the mastermind group, which is a weekly commitment, not only of time, but uh, a monthly commitment on a financial basis, what advice would you give them? I would tell them to give it a try. Come, come and join us or join the other group for one meeting see the interaction, see what's there, see if it's right for you. You know, if, if it's not, the group might not be right for you, but try to make the connection with somebody there to email, to talk to, to, to be there if you need them. Because we all need somebody who's going to understand. And even though our, our kids have different problems and our kids are different ages and our kids, you know, we deal with life differently, we understand where you're at. And I think that's the biggest the biggest thing is you need that. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. It's interesting from my perspective is that the age range of the dads is from the late 20s to 70s. Different parts of the country, all different types of uh, diagnoses with the kids. You know, you'd think that the youngest dads would be the primary benefactors of this, right? Because they're able to sort of draft behind the experience of the more seasoned dads. And the feedback I've gotten is that even the more seasoned dads, the John Chouses and Rich Gathros of the world, get just as much out of this as the younger dads, right? So it's not like it's a one-way street, right? That you know, the older guys are just doing this for the benefit of the younger guys. You know, there's a lot of engagement and it's a very uplifting experience. So like I said, thrilled that you're part of the group. Let's spend a few minutes talking about Project Alex Communities. What's the backstory and what's your vision for that? The backstory all belongs to my wife. Joelle, we were, we were in the car one day and, and she's like, what's going to happen? Where's Alex going to live? Where are we going to be? And her mind raced to, her folks had just moved into a local senior living environment called Friendship Village. And as we're, we're walking around there, she's like, God, there's a lot of similarities between our kids that are disabled and the seniors. You know, they've got different color walls to help them remember how to get to their apartments. They've got people who will cook for them and, and help them out. They've got nurses on staff. They've still got their independence because they can go on a bus. They can do whatever. And, and she's like, you know, I bet this would work if we could put this together for the kids. So that became her giant balloon and her giant thought. And over the years, uh, we, we did a feasibility study because we knew it existed and there was a need for this housing, but nobody else did. So we, we raised funds and, and did a feasibility study. And the guy came back and said, God, there is no place. And it's like, yeah, we told you that. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so he he's like, yeah, this is definitely something that that is needed and definitely something that, that could work. So we hooked up with Joel's brother who had recently retired from DuPont. He has a doctorate in chemistry. So he's very, very detail oriented and enjoys that work where I don't. So he, he started filling out the paperwork and, and the thought process to, to become a nonprofit. We formed a, like an advisory board or steering committee to try to figure out where to go next. And the decision was made to move forward and, and try to figure out the best way to do it. So we formed the nonprofit, we, we created a, a board of directors, but most recently, probably the last uh, six to nine months, we met with a, a gentleman who has a son that's autistic, who is a developer of, of housing and, and strip centers and stuff, who had thought about doing stuff like this so we've moved forward. We now have the developer. 
we now have some basic drawings of what we're going to look like. Now we're down to about a 10 acre site. And what's unique to our thought is we want parents and or community members, people who are comfortable around our kids to live in the same area and create a community, um, community of people who can allow the parents to go on vacation, but feel comfortable that the kids are going to have somebody there to help them out. A community that's there if something happens to the parents, the kids are comfortable and, and the family's comfortable leaving their kids there because they formed the connections and there's people always looking out for each other. And then a, a recent addition that we've sort of come up with is to have a, a small retail strip center on the front of the property so that the kids who are capable have a place to work, uh, a place to train, skills to learn, and, and maybe put in a, a coffee shop or a pizzeria, different things to teach the kids things to do. So we, we are way further than we were. We're going to be starting our capital campaign very shortly to start raising money to buy the land and build the building. We are hoping that this, uh, we're not going to be another, you know, 10 years in the making. We're hoping to get something together in, in, in three to five years. But my brother-in-law and all his detail work ha have put together a, a plan and a corporate structure that would allow us to duplicate this anywhere um, with the corporate structure. So we could just up and move it to the south side or to the city or to a different state or wherever it needs to go. So after the first one proves itself, we're gonna, we can work from there. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Uh, if I can paraphrase what you've said, it's been an evolving uh, vision or process. Um, and at the core or the center, uh, when, what you described is a multi-story residential uh, structure where the individuals, these young adults with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities would be living. And then around that or nearby uh, would be uh, additional family members, right? So that they're in proximity and you know families can look out for one another so they don't always have to be there 24 seven or 100% of the time. And I think that's what makes this project unique, right? It's not just a residential facility where individuals with um, intellectual disabilities might reside, because there's plenty of examples of those. But I think the fact that you're building in the uh, family component and then perhaps a retail component, you know, makes us quite a bit different than most of what is out there. Yeah, well, let's uh, commit to do this. Uh, let's uh, circle back a year, a couple years down the road and uh, do a check-in, sure. right, to see where Project Alex Communities is at that point in time. So I'm thinking about advice now. And I'm wondering if there's any advice that you can offer parents, specifically dads, maybe younger dads for that matter, who find themselves at the beginning of their journey. I, I guess the best advice or the things that I can say is, is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to try to get the best things you need for your kid. Don't run away. There, there's too many dads who... who run away from their kids or run away from their families because they can't deal with not being able to fix a problem. Don't be afraid. Everything will work out and be what needs to be and what, what needs to happen. It just will. It just will. Yeah, well, spoken like a true veteran, thank you for sharing. So I'm sort of curious to know, why have you agreed to be a mentor father as part of the Special Fathers Network? Because I didn't have one. You know, I, I, I tried over the years. and it, I remember we were at therapy and they, they were having a parent support group once. And Joelle and I got, I think, my mom to come and, and watch Alex. I think he was a couple years old. And we walked into the group and into the room. And it was all women. It was all moms. I was the only dad there. And I got bombarded with the, well, why isn't my husband here? what are you doing here? Why can't I get my husband to come? And my answer to them was, I don't know. <laughs> that was my best answer. And so I, I always tried over the years to, to try to reach out to, to dads, whether it be the dads I knew from Special Olympics or the dads that I, you know, met through the tuberous sclerosis group. 
and say, hey, let's go to dinner. Let's talk. Let's do whatever. It just wasn't there. So then when I heard about your group, it was like, yay, I fit right in here. And this is what I've been looking for 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 20 plus years. Yeah, well, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for being part of the Special Fathers Network. If somebody wants to learn more about Project Alex Communities or contact you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, Our website is proj, P-R-O-J, alex.org. We've got some stuff on there. We because we haven't started building yet, we've been running programs for the kids every quarter. So you can look back and see what we've done and, and see what's coming up. You can see what's there uh, if you want to get involved. And uh, you can probably drop me an email through there. Joelle's the, the one who grabs those emails. Um, if you want to reach out to us and, and she can pass it on to me um, and we can kind of, you know, I'll get back to you through there. We'll be sure to include that in the show notes so it'll make it as easy as possible for somebody to follow up with you. Tony, thank you for your time and many insights. As a reminder, Tony is just one of the dads who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Tony, thanks again. Thank you, David. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad-to-dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group, please go to facebook.com groups and search dad to dad. Also, please be sure to register for the Special Fathers Network bi-weekly Zoom calls held on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.